I'd like to welcome everyone to the Community Integration um, Battle Rhythm and welcome our Community Integration Affiliates and Branch Communities, Four Star Alliance members and various veteran support organizations, staff um, from veteran supportive companies and our guests. I'm very excited um, to have Cassie Cheshire and Joshua Javen, the Chief Operating Officer from Travis Minion Foundation, and also Michael Bailey, the Senior Program Manager um, for Leadership Programs at the George W. Bush Presidential Center. They're going to be speaking about empowering veteran leaders and telling us about their leadership programs and the impact they are having on the veteran community at large. And we definitely encourage questions. Please enter those in the chat box so that we can um, follow up with those as needed. After their presentations, Allison will lead us into the breakout discussion activity. Today's session will conclude at about 3.15 at Eastern Time. All right, so I want to again welcome Josh Javen, the Chief Operating Chief Operating Officer at the Travis Minion Foundation. We're going to start today with Josh um, and you know the floor is yours. So just tell us what you brought today. Thanks, Missy. I want to start by just thanking Allison and America's Warrior Partnership for putting this together. Um, it's one of my favorite topics, talking about how we empower our our veterans, and and I think that's an important word. You know, I, I know that that's AWP talks about empowerment a lot. Travis Manion Foundation, we talk about empowerment a lot, and the idea is to um, is to teach people how to fish. Um, sometimes people need you to give them the fish, and sometimes they need you to teach them how to fish. And you know, I know that a lot of the organizations on here understand the importance of teaching people how to fish, and that's what we're doing. Um, if anybody wants to come, uh, wants to come on camera, this is really intimidating seeing a bunch of names. I'd love to see some faces. If hey, Kevin, good to see you. Thank you. Oh, that's so much better. Um, we're gonna. I'm gonna talk for about ten minutes, and then I'm going to um, ask anybody who has questions. Oh, look at all these faces. You guys are the best. Thank you. Oh, that's so much better. Um, so we're really going to make this a discussion. Then I know Michael's going to join us. He's going to talk a little bit, and then we're going to do some breakout sessions. So hopefully the more interactive, the better. I'm already feeling much better. All right, I'm going to share screen share screen quickly, give you a little bit more information about TMF and how we, our model. So we are, Travis Manning Foundation is a community led by veterans and families of the fallen, open to all that serve together and support each other. Everything we do falls in one of two buckets. It's either us, investing in veterans through giving them personal development opportunities or and giving them the opportunity to go out and to lead and to serve. Um, you can see at the bottom how how that model builds on itself. So it starts with us, the the foundation, the the staff empowering those veterans. And when we say empowering, what we're talking about is providing them the training and the support in order for them to be able to go out and use what they learned to um, develop character in future generations. That's the the second part of our mission statement and the end result is that the veterans and the families of the fallen alongside youth are able to team up with the rest of the community and make that that local community impact um, when i talk about personal development the main way that we do that is through what we call the spartan leadership program um, for those that don't know our our members we call them spartans uh, there's a whole long story behind that from when travis um was was in iraq and 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 we we named ourselves uh, after after him and and his inspiration of of the Spartans. So, the Spartan Leadership Program is a seven month course um, that's set up with three in persons, uh, four days at the beginning, a week in the middle, and four days at the end with um, with a bunch of coursework and virtual meetings in between. So this was set up as hybrid. This was. Actually, luckily for us, um, prior to COVID, set up to be a, a hybrid type course. Um, it's been a it's been a great experience for us, and and we really haven't changed all that much, surprisingly. But it's about three to four hours per week of coursework, which includes discussions and practical exercises. Um, our our cohorts of about thirty or so at a, at a time. They meet every other Sunday night from six to eight with our program manager. To, to go through whatever um, lesson it is of the week. Um, in the middle, they do a week-long expedition uh, where they, they get together in Colorado for some physical activity alongside some, some uh, coursework and, and some emotional and, and mental work. Um, each year, we have over 100 people apply. We take, like I said, about 30 each year. Um, so far, we, we have 103 
Spartan Leadership Program graduates. Uh, we've been doing this program for about four years. Um, there's two main goals of the program. Number one is to make sure that each individual gets out of the program, what they're looking to get out of, to grow in whatever area that they tell us they're looking to personally grow in. Um, what we've seen is that they've experienced a 21% increase in thriving scores. So everything that we do is, is grounded in positive psychology. Positive psychology has created this inventory of thriving, which is like a, a, a validated score that, that we can give pre and post surveys so we can see that people are improving in, in their mental health and well-being using that thriving score. Um, and then the second outcome is that these veterans and families of the fallen that go through the program go on to become our volunteer leaders. Um, right now we have uh, 67 of those 103 are our active volunteer leaders. 21 of them uh, run our chapters. We have about 40 chapters across the country. Um, about 21 of them are, are leading those chapters and, and 66 of them are veteran mentors in our character program. So we train and support veterans to go out and develop character, uh, mentor kids about character and leadership and 66 of those participants lead that program. So definitely ha having the the impact that we wanted to have in both of those areas. Um, I added here some of the curriculum topics so you can get a sense of what, what we're, we're um, covering with with each of the cohorts so a lot of self-reflection you know we call it the spartan leadership program i always tell people it's it's not your traditional leadership course you know we make the assumption that people come to us as leaders these are veterans these are families of the fallen who have a lot of life experience they come to us as leaders our job is to is to help them grow in the area that they want to grow in so we provide them with that infrastructure we provide them with the the teammates and the coach to help them grow you know i always say like you know, I was a wrestler most of my life. Um, I think about the type of workouts that I used to get back when I was on a team with with a coach and, and very specific goals. And it's just very different than it is for me today as I go out on my little three mile uh, Marine Corps shuffle. And, um, you know, it's always it's always a lot better to do it with other people and, and having that coach there with you. So so that's what we provide. We provide them that that curriculum. We provide them that infrastructure to to help them grow in 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 whatever area they're they're looking to develop in with the end result being that once they feel that they are better in their personal lives that they are better prepared to serve as those volunteer leaders so that's a little bit about travis magnet foundation that's a little bit about our spartan leadership program um i'm gonna open it up i know that there were some questions submitted and that's where i want to spend the majority of time and then i have a couple questions for you at the end um so you are you are very welcome to come off mute and ask any of the questions that that you submitted. If you feel better chatting, you can do that as well. I'll I'll, I'll always be the first to jump Thanks, in and, Kevin. and save a save a fellow Marine veteran from silence. We we don't like that. But it's good to see everyone. Happy New Year to everyone who joined the call. Uh, I actually see Heather who was in Nashville with me for three days. Uh, at, a, at another conference and convening, but uh, it's really great to join you all and I hope you're all having a great new year. One thing that you, you said really stuck with me, Josh, about giving veterans um, really opportunities to find their continued purpose and, and service opportunities. And the one word that always sticks out with us and, and our mission is the word thrive. So, um, I want to talk a little bit more about that or ask you to to open up because we've had several discussions with DOD um, and other nonprofit organizations about this, this importance of showing our community as thriving and not just surviving. And I'd like for you to talk a little bit more about that um, from your perspective and the opportunities specifically that exist with Travis Mannion and the Spartan um, program, and then maybe tie it a little bit to the discussions that we've had one-on-one, -on -one, sometimes heated, uh, passionate for sure, about how these things tie to the front end of the all-volunteer force, our efforts to recruit um, to all the services, um, and really and really shaping the narrative, I'll say changing the narrative around veterans as broken, when right. we should really be focused on the fact that uh, a vast majority of us, while we've had our challenges, are thriving. And, and and great role models for young people who will serve in the future. Such a great question, Kevin. I mean, we we as I think a a space as all of those that serve veterans. I think we're just in a tough position. You know, there there certainly are 
veterans that have acute needs and some some veterans that that are in crisis and and we need to make sure that we offer them the support that they need but i think we all know that that doesn't represent the vast majority of veterans um many of us many of us um you know when i look at that thriving scale you know we all live on the spectrum at some point right like sometimes sometimes we're in a really good place you know we're all the way to the right on that spectrum you know i i like to say when i got out of the marine corps um now it's been over 10 years you know, I would give myself a, a solid seven or eight. You know, I was doing pretty well. When I first transitioned, though, you know, I started moving back towards the center of that spectrum. You know, there were definitely some difficulties I had in my transition, as I think all of us have something difficult as you make a major life change. Um, you know, luckily for me, I had Travis Mannion Foundation. I was a very involved volunteer leader. And, and as I got towards the middle of that spectrum, I was able to uh, get some help and, and help move me back in the right direction. Um, had I kept going to the left, I know that there's some great organizations that are there to help uh, veterans when they're really in crisis or really in, in need. And that's really important. But I think, you know, to Kevin's point, what we can't allow the American public to think is that all veterans are in crisis, that all veterans have these very acute needs all the time. I mean, that's just not true. Um, sometimes it's true and, and we need to be able to help those veterans. So we can't, we don't want to you know, bury our head in the sand and pretend like it doesn't happen. It sometimes happens. There's certainly veterans in in need, and we got to be able to provide them that help. But but once veterans get back to the center, we have to say, how do we take you from the middle and bring it back to the right? And that's why Travis Manion Foundation exists. You know, I like to say we we serve the people that are somewhere in the middle of that thriving score, that 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 thriving scale, um, and and try to help them to to identify those things. And those things that help you move to the right um, are some of the things that we had. Uh, inherently during our time in military service, right? We woke up every day with that sense of purpose. I know for me, I started, I, I joined the Marine Corps in May, 2001, right? Like two months before September 11th. And, and then I served, you know, my entire 20 year military career as a, as a nation at war post, post 9-11. And, you know, I woke up every day feeling important. I felt like I was serving that higher purpose. You know, in the Marine Corps, you have that camaraderie built in, as as I, I I know all the services do, and and when you get out, those two things specifically get like ripped out from you, and and you don't even know that that's coming, right? That's not something that you talk about when you go through your through TAP or or whatever transition program you go through. You know, you, you focus so much on the job, which is important. We all need to put food on the table, and I get that. You know, I have I have a family. I have three young girls. We we need to be able to support ourselves and our families, but but we don't think about what is important to us and our mental health. And a big part of that is is that sense of purpose. A big part of that is that that camaraderie, the the relationships, and so that's that's what we see as as our main role is providing that you know sense of purpose and and those relationships, along with other great organizations that also help do that. Um, as I know that that's an important part of of what you do, Kevin at Zero Mills, and you know I think that's that's something that a lot of us have. And then to have the partnerships with other organizations who help veterans when they are in crisis or when they have those acute needs, you know, when they are unemployed or when they are homeless or when they are, you know, fill in the blank, you know, having mental health crisis, et cetera. And so, you know, I think we have to like walk a very difficult tightrope, making sure that the American public knows the problems and, and is willing to support our organizations to help veterans in crisis, but, but not paint that, that picture that all veterans are in crisis. Was it, Kevin, since since you brought that up, and anything else that, that you wanted to add to that? Oh, just uh, again, it's great to see um, organizations like Travis Mannion and AWP working together. I think what you articulated is really cool because there is a scale of thriving, there is a spectrum, and you know, we all have different ways of describing what thriving means. And I think if if we use your scale or um, we look at what AWP really specializes in, and then when you're taking someone from the middle, trying to get them to fully thriving, but they might fall, it, it's really important that together organizations and even organizations like Rally Point, who's on here and others, NAFSO, we all see this as a scale where we all have an integral role to play, meaningful employment, finding your sense of purpose through continued service, being part of a connected community, health, and really all those other resources and tools that AWP provides um, and other organizations provide is so critical. So 
what I'm most encouraged about when I see a call like this is the way you're sharing an idea of how you look at it. We certainly have an idea and all the other organizations do, but collectively, as Jim Lorraine always says, we can do better together. I think these are the things that we have to um, aspire to in 2024. When you get all on a call like this, okay, where do we fit? in helping veterans at various stages of that scale? And where are they lacking in the various components of thriving? Like you you have to have all five in my mind to get to that optimal 10 on a scale of one to 10. And I think everyone has a role to play. So I'm just happy to be a part of it and start the, the new year like this, because this really gives me energy to see everyone coming together. And and the, and the, the main point I wanna make is don't ignore the people in the middle. You know, I think sometimes we get so focused on the people in crisis and they need help. And I'm not, you know, I'm not saying take anything away from the great work that's happening for people in crisis, but don't forget the people in the middle because you're, you're never stagnant. You're either moving to the right or you're moving to the left. And and the more that we can get people in, in the center to move to the right, that that becomes that preventative approach, right? So so as, as those, th you know, you're either, you feel that sense of purpose and you have that camaraderie in those relationships and you're moving in the right direction, or the lack of them are some of the 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 main um, the main factors that lead to poor mental health and well being. So trying to get ahead of that, and and I think I think that's the the main thing that that I would tell people. You know, I I'll say something bold that some people may disagree with, but I, you know, when I look at how, how do we attack this 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 problem of of veteran suicide, and I think it's the num the number one problem facing our space right now. But when we look at that, you know, I think we can continue to make incremental improvements on how we deal with people in crisis. But I think the the real improvement to the overall problem is going to come when we when we focus more on the people before they're in crisis, the, the people that are in the middle that that are moving trending in the wrong direction. But can we catch them before they move into crisis? And and I think that's just an area that most people have not put a whole lot of of energy into. I, I just think that's a hard concept for people to wrap their brains around. I think that's a hard concept for the American public to wrap their brains around. It's very easy to 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 focus on people that are in crisis. And that's, I think, what um, you know most people end up focusing on. But can, can we find them in the middle and, and think about that proactive approach to mental health? Josh, I couldn't agree with that more. I think that is exactly what you're saying is getting ahead of the crisis. Like, let's keep them keep them stable, keep them moving forward um, in a positive way. And that's the best way to prevent, um, you know, any, any kind of crisis, whether it's financial, mental health, any of those things. Um, in the chat, uh, Susan stole my question, um, which I've already getting texts from my uh, team here is, what does the application process look like um, and how can people get involved? So, so ours for uh, the Spartan Leadership Program, I assume you're, you're, you're saying, Missy, our, our specific program. Um, it's on our website, um, Cassidy. Maybe maybe you could just link the the website page. It it actually just closed for this year. We're in the process. We had over 100 people apply. We're in the process right now. We just did a, an interview process to select the 30 that will kick off next month. Um, but but again, we'll put out the applications next December. So you got got a little it's bit amazing. Of, uh, yeah. Um, and I'll tell you, like one of one of our biggest challenges right now is what do we do with the the seventy people that don't get selected? That's the hard part for us. Is you know, it's a it's a very intensive program. It's a very expensive. Well, I, relative, you know, I guess that word expensive is all relative, right? But it, it costs us about ten thousand dollars per person. So our thirty people cost us about three hundred thousand dollars a year. And and right now, what we're trying to do is create other opportunities for the people that don't get selected for these thirty. The nice thing is a lot a lot of times people come back and apply the following year. That's one thing that we always tell people is. If you're not selected this year, you know what we hope is that you get involved with our other programs over the course of the next year, and then reapply next December because that's, you know, to me when somebody applies for the second time, we just had somebody um, who applied for the third time, and so she was she was our our number one this time, and we got her in this time. But oh, that's um, great. Yeah, I I love when people come back, you know, show show that consistency. Okay, you had uh, several questions from our team about uh, where you're located, what what your branches or where your presence is, but Heather is in the chat, just answering people left and right. Thank you, um, Heather. Yeah, so she's uh, definitely supporting. How do organizations empower veteran leaders in their communities? How do other organizations go about doing this? So this was actually my question for the group. Um, okay. I, I, I'll open that one up. Does anybody else wanna, wanna jump in and, and give us an example of how some other organizations empower 
veterans and families of the fallen in their local community? Well, I'll jump on that. So I'm Bill Brown. I'm at ECPI University in Virginia Beach. And um, so I work with our student veterans um, club, right? And so our campus, we've, we have about 500 vets on this campus. And, um, you know, sometimes getting students involved in, in activities is hard, especially when they're older. But the, what I've, where we've had the most luck is really giving them the opportunity. Don't, I say yes to a lot of things, even though I know sometimes they may not work. You know, but nobody's going to get hurt. It's not going to cost a ton of money. And I, I let him. And so my leader of the Student Veteran Club, she uh, just came to me. We were at the Student Veteran Conference uh, last week in Nashville, the SVA. And she learned a lot about yoga uh, for veterans. And she wanted to start a yoga club, do like yoga every once in a while on campus. So I'm like, all right, fine. We'll get room 360. It's got a nice carpet in there. We can do that. Move the tables. And she was like, oh, my gosh, that's great. I love my job. I get to do things and make a difference. You know, and so just by, you know, sometimes just encouraging them to to explore activities that mean something to them, you know, it may not have been something I definitely want to include in on it. And I'll do my best to stretch. And, uh, you know, Hugo will laugh at me. I'm sure if he saw me doing that, we go way back. But I'm going to I'm going to give her a shot. And, you know, and I just give them the opportunity to try it and support them financially and um, and, and then also help them to take care of the uh, the admin stuff so they don't have to worry about that. That's I love that answer, Bill. You know, I think one of the big challenges so for, for anyone who wasn't reading the chat, you know, Travis Manny Foundation, we're a national organization. We have we have local presence in in about 100 different communities across the country, formal chapters in about 40 of them. But, you know, for a national organization like we we, we don't pretend like we have all the answers at the national level. You know, it's 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 a challenge for us. We, we want to make sure that we have good guidance, that we have good left and right limits. But but we really believe that the best answers come from those individuals, those individual people, those individual communities. And so, you know, like to Bill's point, it, it, that, that was a very Marine thing to say, you know, if you're not going to break something expensive, or we'd like to say in the Marine Corps or kill people, uh, hopefully that's not happening for most of our programs, then then go ahead and try it, you know, and let's see how it works. Um, one of the values at, at Travis Manning Foundation, we say build, measure, learn, repeat. And, you know, that's really built into our culture of Try things out. If if you see something at the local level that 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 you think is a is a problem and you think you have a good way of addressing it, go try it out. You know that's why we try to keep our our initiatives very broad at the local level to give that that power to those local leaders to to make those decisions. And and the worst that happens is we find out you know what it didn't work and we're not going to do more of it. And if it did work, well, let's figure out how we do more of it. Um, Missy, did Michael join yet? I'm I'm trying to be conscious of time. Yes, Michael is here. Um, so thank you, Josh. Before you introduce him, can I just give him a sh Bush Institute a, sure. a shout out? So the way that our Spartan Leadership Program actually came to be was that our CEO Ryan Mannion went through the Bush Institute Program um, about five years ago, and she had a great experience. It was the first cohort. She had a great experience, and she came back and she told me and our 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 uh, program chief at the time, Janae, she said, both of you need to go through this program. It was great. I learned so much. And um, and so Janae and I both looked at the program and um, we thought it, it looked great, but um, had a lot of family responsibilities that prevented us, you know, from, from doing some of the travel that was involved at that time. I, I actually don't know, Michael, you can correct me if it's changed, but it, it was one, one week a month in DC, Seattle, some of uh, the Dallas, some of the different cities around the country. And uh, it was, it was so, so what we ended up saying is, how could we take something like what the Bush Institute did? And I think you guys have a very, um, a very uh, specific audience of, of leaders like Ryan Mannion and, and other major nonprofits or corporations and, and other people making, making big change. And we said, how can we take that model and 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 change it for a different audience. I, I actually saw Tia was on here. I don't I don't know if she still is, but Tia is one of our participants of, of of our Spartan. There she is of our Spartan Leadership Program. So, you know, we we looked at at just changing it for a different audience and, and making less less in person, more virtual. And uh, and so I just want to give them credit. You guys were the inspiration for us. And you know, one of the things that I think a lot of people um, you know on this call can think about is how do you take the the good stuff that other people are doing. If you think that you have a slightly different audience or you think you have like a slightly different version that might fit your population better, you know, how do you take that good work and and make that transition? I think I think our Spartan Leadership Program was a good example of how we were able to 
take a, a program that was working really well for that audience and shift it to ours. With that, Michael, I'll, I'll let you hand, or, or Missy, you can introduce him, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I think you've done a great job. I'd hate to duplicate efforts, but Josh, thank you so much for your presentation. That was wonderful. And um, everybody, this is Michael Bailey. He's a senior program manager for the George Bush Presidential Center. Uh, Michael, thank you so much for being here today. Thank you, Josh, and thank you, Missy. It's great to be with you all. And uh, Josh, thank you for your kind words as well. And um, really excited to share more about our Stand To Veteran Leadership Program, which is the program I manage here at the George W. Bush Institute. Um, I'll share some details, save plenty of time for questions, and happy to connect afterwards if you have additional thoughts or questions. But um, we created this program in 2018, and the idea behind it was to um, engage uh, and enhance the skills of those who serve our nation's veterans and help them increase their impact. So we seek to bring in a diverse cohort each year um, of diverse professionals across the country who are kind of mid-career, but in an inflection point in their um, in their careers where they want to take it to the next level or um, take some lessons they're learning from the program and apply them in a tangible way. And so 2018 was our first cohort. Ryan Mannion was a part of that uh, first class, as you mentioned, Josh. And we have um, held that program annually with the exception of 2020. And each year we select about um, 35 to 40 um, scholars into the class. It varies in terms of numbers. We don't have a set um, headcount each year that we're looking for. Um, but we uh, want to include veterans, active duty, military spouses, civilians. You don't have to have served to be a part of the program, but we really think those diverse voices are important for the conversations that are meant to be had uh, while you're participating. Um, it's a five month program. Uh, this, this year, uh, we actually just closed our applications for the class of 2024 on Friday of last week. Um, but for this year, the program uh, year will run June through October. It's about um, two and a half to three and a half uh, days out of your month. Um, uh, at the Bush Center. We, so we used to travel a little bit more than we do now, but um, four of the modules are at the George W. Bush Center in Dallas, Texas. Um, they're each two and a half to three and a half days, and then we do a travel mod. This year, we're going to go to Washington, D.C. Um, for that module in September. And there's different things that we deliver throughout the program, um, kind of programmatic components that we think are important. First of all, is the diverse network of peers that um, come into the cohort with you. Um, <clears throat> we honestly believe that the secret sauce is not necessarily what we're providing, but more so what you all are providing to each other through your experience in this program. You're the experts driving the really positive, um, amazing impact for veterans and military families in your community. And so just bringing you all together in the same room um, is really important to us and providing that space for you to really share your expertise and learn from each other. Um, we have access to resources um, and kind of specific curriculum that we deliver throughout the, each of the modules. And so there's four leadership pillars that are tried and true to our program, something we want uh, every scholar who comes in to come away with a general understanding of these leadership pillars. And that's uh, vision and communication, um, decision making, strategic partnerships and influence and persuasion. So we have content sprinkled throughout there. We also work very closely with our veterans and military families team here at the Bush Institute. And so there is content sprinkled around um, the areas that we're thinking about at the Bush Institute, which is mostly focused on veteran transition. So areas from education to opportunity to employment to health and well-being. Those are kind of some of the, the topics that we'll include in conversations as well. Um, and then um, general inspiration and exposure. So part of the um, each module is we'll bring in experts who've lived a uh, extensive career and have lots of leadership lessons to to share from from their time um, and where they're going from here. And then the um, kind of most core part of the program that is my favorite part and always really special to see is what we call the personal leadership project. Um, it's a project that everyone enters the program with uh, for the application process, and it is a project of particular passion that you may have. Um, that you want to take and advance for the impact of veterans and military families in your community. And so personal leadership projects can can really run the whole gamut in terms of um, work that, that our scholars are doing for impact for veterans and military families. Um, but as you apply to the program, we want you to be clear about how um, the, the, the project you are seeking to solve, why you're the person to solve this problem, and then how participating in this program will help you um, succeed in the project you've outlined 
And then once you come into the program, it's less and less about the success on the project itself and more about um, how you're taking the lessons you're learning, both from what we're providing and from your peers, um, and kind of uh, putting all of that together in a tangible way through this PLP. And so at the end of the program in module five, which will be in October this year, you'll present your project on stage at the Bush Center. It's TED Talk style. We have um, uh, feedback panelists who are providing supportive thoughts for you on how you can um, better enhance your project, maybe areas you can connect on or people they should connect you with to help you advance the work you're doing. Um, but it's always a really neat culmination of, of your time and experience in Stand 2 BLP. And um, really that's kind of the, the program at large. Again, we um, accept mid-career professionals, military spouse, active duty veterans, civilians, um, and we bring them together in person for five months out of the year. And then you go and be a part of our alumni network, which um, has, after the class of 2023, which wrapped in November of this last year, we've brought in over 210 um, scholars who have gone through the program since 2018. So that network will continue to grow. And we have a lot of strategy around how you stay connected, both with us and with your fellow peers um, during and after your participation in the program. That's a quick overview of, of everything that I have. Um, I'll pause and see if anyone has any questions or initial thoughts. Michael, I just want to ask, since I said it, I want to see if you agree with my my summary or or if you want to correct me, but your your audience would tend to be more of the the, le the nonprofit leaders, the corporate leaders, the government leaders, like more like the people on this call, not necessarily the, the veterans at large, correct? Like ours is more aimed at our volunteer leaders Yours would be aimed at like the nonprofit leaders. Do you, is that correct? It, that's part of the diversity. So we want um, we want for profit. We want nonprofit. We want government. We want all of that represented in the class. Um, we do look for it, it, we loosely define mid career professionals, um, but leaders who have had enough experience so far in their careers that they can take the lessons they're learning and apply them um, so that they have plenty of runway after their participation in the program to continue to advance great great change for for veterans and military families in their community. So it's not um, solely for nonprofit. We look for um, a wide range of folks and and that's part of the the secret sauce of bringing you all together in person each month to learn from your various expertise. And Michael, when does the class of 2025 application process yes. open? So um, that we don't have a hard set date yet, but it will be in October of 2024. Um, so as I said, we just wrapped the 2024 class application this last week. Um, I will post a link in the chat here to our landing page for VLP. Um, I highly recommend uh, signing up for our mailing list, which is on that page. And if you are interested, you'll be the first to know once that application is live. It's open for about two and a half months. So we'll open it approximately middle of October of this year and keep it open through early in the new year of 2025. Great. Stacy, what do you got? Yeah, I just want to say, hi, Michael. My name is Stacy Gordon. I'm, I'm a military transition coach, but I'm a volunteer mentor for Higher Heroes USA. And just last week, I was helping my protege apply for the program. And what was really neat is she said, Stacey, I'm done, but I feel like I want to connect with some people, you know, who have walked before me just for feedback. So both of us got on LinkedIn and we were reaching out to the scholars and they were all, you know, helping her. And I just wanted to say, you know, it was amazing. And then she texted me, Stace, I, I applied, it's in. And, you know, so it's just, I want you to know that it's, you know, your whole community came together to help this, you know, hopefully hopeful, if you will, for your program. So uh, I just wanted to say kudos yeah. to that. I, I love to hear that. Thank you so much. And and yeah. if anyone is ever interested in learning more, or if there's someone you think that would be a good candidate for the program, always happy to connect with them. And we, you know, people will reach out and ask to be connected with alumni, we can make that happen as well. So they can um, hear more about the experience directly from someone who went through it. Stacey, that's such a great story to share. Thank you. That gave me all the feels. Um, of course. <laughs> other questions for Michael? I have not seen anything else in the chat, but you, you can just pipe up. Oh, Nika, if you're talking, I think you're muted. Sorry, actually, my um, office mate was asking a question about the program and I was <laughs> relaying it to him because he's listening from the other side of the office. So, oh, sorry. nice. 
<laughs> collaborating. I love it. All right. Well, Michael, is there anything, I know you said that you look for a like mid-level, but when you're reviewing these applicants that they go in, like Stacey said, they just went through this process. Is there any one thing that you really looked like set applicants apart or how do y'all, I'm sure you get tons of applications. How do you process all that? Yeah, it, it is a very competitive program and it, it's getting more competitive uh, each and every year, which is a wonderful thing to see. Um, I would say the, the personal leadership project is a huge, huge piece of the application and something we take very seriously. Um, and it's less about the project itself that you're describing and more so about uh, really thoughtfully talking about why you're the person to solve this problem and why specifically participating in the Stand 2 Veteran Leadership Program will help you succeed in that project. So if you are, I mean, you may be the most successful person and describe a project that you frankly could probably go and do without, with or without Stand 2 VLP. So I think being clear about the project you're seeking to solve or work on and why you're the person to do that and then how this program will really help you succeed in, in doing that project. So I would say that's probably one of the most um, important factors of the application. And then I would also um, say that humility is a big piece of, of the project. We want to bring in people who are very excited and eager to learn from their peers um, and willing to be challenged. Um, there's difficult conversations that we have throughout the program. And so I think, you know, really being able to talk about examples from your career um, where you've either been challenged as a leader or had to think differently or, you know, talk about how you've learned from various perspectives in the room. I think those are really important pieces to, to draw into your application. Okay, this is for everyone. If you know of any organizations that offer leadership training in your community, please enter it in the chat. Um, and Michael, I also had a follow-up question to that um, about your community. You mentioned earlier that y'all do a travel uh, module. So uh, what's the point, or not what's the point, but what is accomplished by the travel or how do you just determine where you're gonna go and what you're gonna do? Yeah, and I should have noted this at the front too. We're very fortunate to have wonderful funding donors and um, the program is, is completely uh, at no cost, no cost to the scholar. Um, so we cover all, all costs from, from travel, lodging and, and food and accommodations while you're with us. Um, but the travel module itself is specifically designed to provide experiences that you would uh, not receive in any other way, like if you're in Dallas, Texas at the Bush Center. And so, um, you know, you, we'll spend four of the five modules here in Dallas, but uh, we've chosen Washington, D.C. the past couple of years for several reasons. One, um, there's a lot of just natural synergies to go to D.C., um, visit with, you know, policymakers or leaders who um, may not be able or willing to travel to Dallas, but we can meet with more easily in D.C., connect our scholars with, you know, some of the the think tanks and some of the um, uh, uh you know, journalist agencies and others that are in the DC area that um, would love to hear our scholars' stories and, and learn more about their work. Um, and then unique experiences that we can't provide in Dallas. So like last, so last year for the class 2023, for example, we did a White House tour. We spent time with the VA secretary at the VA. Um, we went to the Washington Commanders football game that week, um, took all the scholars there. Um, so just kind of fun experiences that you wouldn't otherwise get um, while, while you're here in Dallas at the Bush Center. So we take the travel module very seriously. It's not just a chance to get out and have fun somewhere else. Um, we want to provide you all with some really cool, unique experiences that, that, um, will inspire you and, and, um, you know, continue to, uh, inspire you as you continue through the program. I'm glad you said Dallas. In my mind, for whatever reason, I was thinking College Station at the library. So <laughs> I would have been going to the wrong place anyway. It's, it's uh, easy to get it mixed up. <laughs> Sherry at Easter Seals uh, would love to know how many people are in each cohort. So it, we really don't have a hard set number that we select each year. I would say um, 35 to 40 is kind of our, our sweet spot. We have had cohorts of 50 in the past, and we felt that was a little too large just from a networking building standpoint from the for the scholars in the class themselves. Um, so 35 to 40 is probably the number we'll we'll stick with for the foreseeable future, but um not to say we wouldn't have 42 or you know 33. We don't have a hard set number. 
And um, I, I can't reveal a huge, I said this other chat here on how many um, applied the most recent slots. I can't reveal exact numbers, but um, it is a very, very competitive program and our numbers continue to grow um, hundreds and hundreds each year. So um, we're excited to, to see the continual growth uh, and interest in the application pool. Well, I'm sure you do get a lot of interest, especially with it being at no cost to the participant. I mean, it's just an incredible opportunity to learn so many things in a field you're already in. It just seems like the stars would align for probably all of us in this uh, meeting right now. So that's great. Um, okay. Anything, any other questions or Michael, anything else you wanted to share before we um, head into the breakout sessions? Nothing else from, from my end. Just I put my email there in the chat. If, if, if you have any other follow-up questions or ever want to get connected, please reach out. Sounds great. Well, Michael and Travis, thank you both so much. Um, we really appreciate you spending your time with us today and, and giving us these resources that are incredible. Um, Allison, I'm going to turn it over to you to talk about uh, breakout activities. Can everybody see my screen now? Excellent, thank you. Okay, so we are going to begin our breakouts. Today we have our breakouts, our empowered leaders, empowering personal growth and forms of leadership. So empowering leaders, leaders that's with um, Josh and empowering personal growth, that is with um, Cassidy and forms of leadership today is gonna be led by Hugo Lentz from Rally Point, yay, thank you. And thank you guys for agreeing to lead these um, breakouts. Remember the breakouts are just conversation. The leads are just there to get the conversation started. They're not there to give you another presentation. It's to have that good discussion that we, we all need in order to learn and, and be able to apply the knowledge that we've gained. So I think I have, we have about, you know, I think we'll have 25 minutes. So I'm gonna, so I'm gonna go ahead and open those breakout rooms. Make sure you know which one you're going to um, select now. And if you need help, just stay online and I'll give you a hand. Welcome back, everybody. Hope you had a great, a great um, breakout. So I see. Let me make sure I've got everybody back. It looks like I do. You can go ahead and turn your um, video on if you want. So and I think everybody's back in. Okay. So topic number one. So. Um, Josh, do you have someone that's going to give your key takeaway or are you going to share it for us? I don't know. Did anybody, Bernie, you said you were taking notes. Did you, did you have anything major you wanted to report? <laughs> no? All right. Hi, everybody. So group one, we um, shared a few things. Uh, one of the primary questions um, that Josh asked right off the bat was how do we empower veterans? Each organization kind of spoke on um, some of the things that we do to to help veterans. Uh, for myself, I shared that I run a nonprofit and through that I use a four-step plan to connect, educate, advocate, and collaborate with veterans. We went around the room and everybody talked a little bit about time management in our in our critic, um, criti critic uh, thriving, um, you know, just really connecting and leading to inspire. So Josh, you can jump in and the only the only thing that I'll add to that is is where we end that conversation, which is you know I think all the groups that were part of our breakout all empower veterans. I think the the next step with the empowering the leaders um, is is how do how do those veterans take that information and take those resources and how do they turn around and use those to benefit other veterans as well. Excellent. How about um, breakaway number two, breakout number two, empowering personal growth. So that was. Um, Chas Cassidy. Yeah, that was me. <laughs> um, did anyone take notes? I'm not, we didn't really discuss that, but I'm happy to present a few takeaways if we didn't. I took notes. Oh, perfect. So let me go back to my notes. So we talked a bit about how leaders can empower those around them and how um, leaders can be empowered themselves. So we talked about things like organizations prioritizing personal growth and empowerment, indicating the strength of the organization's leadership. Uh, we spoke about how communication is the key. It's important to allow individuals to allow space for people to participate in a truly collaborative process. This increases the level of trust as well. Um, there was a quote that somebody said, I can't remember, but if you ever feel threatened by someone, learn from them, don't compete with them observation and reflection is a key to leadership as well. 
Um, we also spoke about the importance of leaders leading by example, having an open line of communication, but also we talked about um, being solutions focused. Mistakes happen, but this is an opportunity for everyone around to learn from those mistakes and improve going forward. And that helps encourage a positive mindset. So instead of focusing on the negative of the mistake, how can we fix it? So those are just a few takeaways that I gathered from the conversation. Excellent, excellent. Thank you. Thank you guys. Um, topic number three, forms of leadership. Hugo? So I, I've done these before. So I empowered Roy to, to be our note taker. So Roy, you got it, take it away. Yeah, so I guess the, the synopsis of our, our breakout session was, you know, know your audience. Um, know know who you're engaging with, what works for them, what doesn't work for them. As a leader, knowing that your way may not be the best way for everybody. And you kind of have to tailor that to your to your audience. So that's that's really the the key takeaway. Know your audience and uh, adjust for the situation. Yeah, the only thing I would throw in is is remember a lot of us are dealing with clients who are all over the place on their level of maturity and readiness for input. Um, and so that's that's where that adjustment, know your audience is is key. What works with one certainly may not work with another. So thanks, Roy. Yeah, that that's that is very true. We um just in general, like there there's not that many, I mean there are leadership programs and it was a little it was difficult to find some. So if you if you think of any, shoot me an email if anybody thinks of any programs that offer leadership. Um, or organizations that offer leadership programs. I know that Dog Tag Bakery, Josh had told me about, also does, but for a different type of person on the, you know, different type of veteran. So where you are in, in your your in your life, also having a leadership program that really fits that person on their along their where they travel is important, and where they are right now, and what their what their needs are. So I I am really would love to find out more if you guys share with me some more of those leadership programs, you know, I'll add them to the after action. All right, your, so I'm gonna, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say your local colleges are a good good source for that. Uh, they, a lot of them have clubs. Like we have a, a, a toasters club here where it helps you be a better public speaker or, you know, that this, that, and the other, so. Which is a different form of leadership, right? So very, very good. Thank you. Thank you for that, Roy. Missy, I'm gonna hand it back to you to share. That Perfect. Thanks, Allison. Um, so thank you, Josh and Michael, again, for your uh, really informative presentations. I know I got a lot out of it. I know everyone else did too. Thank you to Roy and Bernie um, and to Jay for um, taking notes for us today. That's always um, my favorite part of Battle Rhythm is hearing the takeaways from the different groups that we didn't get to participate in. Um, thank you for collaborating and sharing. At America's Warrior Partnership, we partner with communities to improve veterans' quality of life um, and thereby reducing veteran suicide um, and death by self-harm. We believe that communities are best equipped to improve the veteran quality of life. And our goal at America's Warrior Partnership and our goal today is to provide community partners like yourself with support, information, and best practices to help you deliver quality services to veterans in your community. The next Battle Rhythm is February 5th, and we're going to focus on empowering marital relationships. Um, we hope you can attend. I apologize if you're hearing the storm that's hitting my window right now. I've probably got some background noise going on. Um, thank you guys so much for being here. It's wonderful to see you all, and I hope you have a great day. Thanks, everybody.